please, the book of Luke chapter 3. Begin reading there, and while you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3, I want to welcome those who are visiting with us today. We're glad to have Christopher Day from Beaver, PA. Good to have you with us. And Zachary Noferl from Overland Park, Kansas. Good to have you with us. And Tyler Nolf from Sarver, PA. It says here, college friends. All right. Awesome. Then we have Gene Frost from York, PA. Good to have you with us. And uh, Max Nicewanger from Erie. Good to have you with us. And Pandora Courtney from Erie. Thank you for coming. And Connie Herbstritt from St. Mary's, PA. Uh, great. Good to have you here with us, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and being part of our service. All right, we should be at Luke chapter 3. I'd like to read verses 1 through 3 and then verses 15 through 17. Follow with me in your Bibles, if you would, please. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iurea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse 15. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into this garner, but the chaff will be burned with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached to you unto the people. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to come together in this place that you've so graciously and generously provided for us. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you, of course, because you first loved us, and you've shed your love abroad in our hearts that we might love you back. And today, my Father, as we look into the Word of God, I pray that you would use the Word of God to challenge us, to convict us, to change us, as well as to comfort us. And I pray, my Father, you might open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person, whether they're in this place or watching or listening. Open their hearts to your word that you might do the work that only you can do, the work you desire to do, the work we need you to do in our hearts and lives. We ask your blessing. We give you all the glory and praise in the name of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Fire is often associated with God in the Bible. It is used as a symbol of God in Deuteronomy and Psalms and Ezekiel, as well as Malachi, Matthew, and the Revelation. The wrath of God is compared to fire in Psalm 18.8, and the Word of God is called a fire in Jeremiah 23 and verse 29. And it was the fire of God that fell to show acceptance of the sacrifices that were on the dedication altar at both the temple and the tabernacle and at Mount Carmel. The fire of God was also used to show the judgment of sin, as with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God even speaks of the fire of His jealousy in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 5. And today we want to take a little bit of a look at this fire of God. My first point this morning is this, fire and production. Fire and production. Fire that is controlled is a productive thing. But a wildfire can be a destructive thing. And I believe that in 21st century Christianity, we are experiencing a lot of wildfire, or as it's called in Leviticus chapter 10, strange fire, like that which uh, Nadab and Abihu offered and God did not accept. Fire that has its source in human invention, sort of like a match in a forest. It's a deceptive fire and destroys the testimony of biblical Christianity. 
In these last days, we need to be the productive fire of God. That's what we need in our churches. We need the fire of God that comes into our midst and burns with a hot and fiery fire to light us up for the Lord Jesus Christ. A fire that produces holiness and righteousness. A fire that preaches hell hot and heaven glorious. A fire that has as its source the Almighty God and as its authority the Word of God. Now, a productive fire produces at least three things. Number one, it produces light. Amen? There is something about a light in the darkness that attracts, especially to people who are lost. We've all heard about the light in the darkness or that light at the end of the tunnel. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, if you would. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. I want us to look at verses 14 through 17. Matthew chapter 5. And we begin at verse 14 where the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. And he says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he gives this admonition in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. See, now it's personal, isn't it? When he's talking in verse 14 and 15, it could be anybody. But now he's pointing the finger at the individuals that are standing before him. And he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so today the finger of God points to you. And God is pointing to you and saying, Hey, Christian, let your light so shine so that men may see your good works and glorify not you, but glorify your Father which is in heaven. When a Christian has the fire of God burning within, they will be a beacon of light to those around them. People ought to be able to just feel Jesus in your presence. They ought to be able to see Jesus on your countenance. They ought to be able to, to just sense the Lord Jesus when you speak. You're supposed to be a light. But I want you to notice that the light in this verse, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. I want you to notice the light is not the good works, but rather the light makes the good works visible. You got it? Let your light so shine before men. The light doesn't produce the works. The light shines on the works that are being produced in you. There are a lot of good works in the world that men call good works. But our light, the light of Jesus Christ, should be shining on our works so that all of our good works are attributed not to us, not to a movement, not to somebody else, but to the Lord Jesus. Because John 8, 12 says, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is the light. And when we have Jesus, we have light. The light of life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Without Christ... There's only life. Life in the darkness of this world. I'm going to call it dark life. But when you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's light and life. So now you have light life. So either you're here this morning and you're living dark life without Jesus, or you have Christ as your Savior and you have light life. Now, I, I lived in dark life, and now I live in light life. And it's a whole lot nicer over here in light life than it was over here in dark life. When Jesus shined the light, whoa, boy, it opened up a whole new world for me. Amen? Amen. And so, productive fire produces light. If we've got the fire of God burning within us, we ought to be producing some light. Number two, how about heat? The fire of God that burns within the human heart produces a heat that can be perceived. 
in Luke 24, verse 32, and they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while, we, while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Here these disciples had met the Lord Jesus along the way and uh, they didn't recognize him and he taught them and talked to them. And when he did, there was a burning sensation that they had within them and, and they, comp they, they uh, commented on it afterwards. Did not our heart burn within us? That word burn is the Greek word kayo. It means to set on fire, to kindle a flame. These men are saying when we walked with him, there was a fire kindled in my heart. When we walked with Jesus, there was a, a fire kindled inside of me, a fire I didn't have before I was walking with Jesus. When God speaks to us through his word, he can stoke a fire. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, the fire of God will burn within. Listen, the wood for the fire of God is prayer and Bible reading. And maybe, Christian, you don't have a fire on, on the inside because you're just not putting any wood on the fire. You're not spending any time in prayer. You're not spending any time in meditation with the Lord Jesus. You don't sit and talk with Him about things and let Him speak to you through His Word. You're not spending time in the Bible. No wonder your fire is just a little flicker. It needs wood. It needs fuel. The heart that has the fire of God is a heart that will attract those who are lost in the cold darkness of this world. And so a productive fire, the fire of God will produce light in you. The fire of God will produce heat in you. Number three, energy. One of the great benefits of fire is energy. Go with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. You know, I think sometimes we're Guilty of being like the presidential candidate that was called low energy. Remember him? Remember the low energy candidate? I think some Christians are low energy Christians. And the reason they're low energy is because they just don't got no fire. Where are we at? Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Look there with me. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You see that word zealous? That word zealous comes from a root word that means to be hot. It means to boil, actually. And so the word is saying here that God has redeemed us. He's paid the price of our sin so that he could purchase us to himself when we trust Christ by grace through faith. And he has redeemed us that we might be a zealous people. We might be an excited people. We might have energy. We might be boiling over. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here's my handle. Here's my spout. Turn me over and pour me out. Amen? Well, what's that other part about when I get all steamed up? Hear me what? Oh, man, that's a pretty pitiful shout. When I get all steamed up, hear me? Yeah. There we go. Amen. I think we need some shouting Christians. My oh my. God said, I want a people that are boiling over with the enthusiasm and spirit of God. He said, I want people that are excited about being saved and excited about the possibility of loved ones and friends and neighbors and strangers getting saved and going to heaven. Fire of God within causes us to be boiling with good works, boiling over with Jesus, with fervor and ardor. You know, the only way to stop water from boiling is to turn off the fire. Sometimes I think Christians just kind of turn down the dial. 
The Lord starts working in their heart. Boy, they feel them working. They hear some message or they're reading the Bible. And uh, they don't want to get too zealous. They just turn, they turn it back. I don't know. When I want to get water boiling, I crank it all the way up. How about you? You know, you put that pot on the water on the, on the stove there. You just don't turn it on, you know, one. I like to crank it all the way up. Fire's coming up on the other side of that thing, burning the handle, melting it all over the stove. And this is not just something for Sunday or something for show or something for shallow public consumption. This is to be every day, all day. We should be on fire for the Lord. A fire fed from an eternal source, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we each have a choice. We can either stoke the fire of God or we can turn down the heat. It's up to you. But my second point is this. Not only is there fire in production, but the second point, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, is fire in... Now we like that fire in production, but here we're going to get to the fire in purging. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28, fire and purging. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I want you to notice what it says in verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom and cannot be moved. You know what? If you're born again, if you're saved here today, you have received a kingdom that cannot be moved. A kingdom that can never be overrun. A kingdom that can never be taken over. A kingdom that can never be defeated. You have received the kingdom of God. Isn't that exciting? I don't know what's going to happen in America. I got my doubts right now. I'm kind of, I'm kind of you know, concerned about it. To tell you the truth, things are going all cattywampus. But I have a kingdom that never gets moved. And so he says, you have this kingdom. And he says, Where, uh, and we have gotten grace from God. Grace is the power of God to do what we cannot do ourselves. He said, whereby we may serve God acceptably. Now, if it says serve God acceptably, what it says to my brain is this. You can serve God unacceptably. If there's acceptably, there's got to be unacceptably. And then he says with reverence and godly fear. That's what's lacking today. What's lacking toward God is reverence. And godly what? Fear. He says why? Because our God's a consuming fire. God is not some, you know, old grandpa up in the sky. He's a consuming fire. The creator God, the almighty God, is not a being to be messed with. He's not somebody to play games with. He loves you, and he loves you more than you could ever know, and he's done everything possible for you to escape and be saved, but there's coming a day when God's going to be the judge. Right now, he's the Savior. Now, you wait too long, you won't meet him as the Lamb of God, the Savior. You're going to meet him as the judge, and he's a consuming fire. The word consuming can be used in both a positive and negative way. Number one, positive. As the Lord is a consuming our lives like a candle that burns. You see, the Lord consuming our lives. The consuming of our time, the consuming of our talents and treasure in order to bring light to a dark world and heat to a cold planet and energy to a sluggish church. Somebody once said, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Amen? Look at, well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Here we have the refining process of fire, burning away the dross and impurities from metal. And he's using that as an illustration to us that there are going to be things that come into our lives that are tr fiery trials. But the fiery trials are not designed to destroy you, dear Christian. The, it's meant to refine you. It's meant to take away the sin out of your life 
Sometimes it's only in our trials and our desperation and our circumstances of great need that we actually come to God and we actually talk to God and we actually are ready to get right with God and we actually do some introspection. And that's good. It's a refining process. I don't know how many times, even as an unsaved person, I'd be getting myself in a jam, and I'd go to God and pray, Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this one, I'll do that. Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this one, I'll do that. And even now, it's sometimes the fiery trials in our lives that bring us to our knees before God, isn't it? That's right. It's the needs that bend the knees. Now, there's a negative consuming fire, and that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go there. You see, the positive of the consuming fire is that he's trying to, cons- he's trying to refine you, trying to burn away the dross, the impurities, the sin that's in our lives. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it's used in a negative sense. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. There's a day when we're going to have to meet Jesus. And it says here in verse 15, this phrase, yet so as by fire. You know, in the Revelation, John gives a visual account of his vision of Christ and says that the Lord's eyes are as a flaming fire. And 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 as I read this, It says we shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Every man's work shall be tried uh, by fire, revealed by fire. Honestly, my friends, I believe that what it's referring to is those eyes that are like a flame of fire of the Lord Jesus, who's able to look into our lives as Christians, and the, the fiery gaze of the Lord Jesus burns away all the wood, hay, and stubble and gets down to the real gold, silver, and precious stones. You following me? And this phrase, yet so as by fire, here's what it's saying. It says we're all going to appear before Jesus. All Christians will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All Christians will have their works looked at with the fiery gaze of Jesus. All Christians are going to suffer loss, and all Christians are going to have rewards, and no Christians getting in except going through that process. That's what that phrase, yet so is by fire, means. You're saved by the grace of God. You're kept by the power of God. Your works are either rewardable or not rewardable, but you've got to go through this process. It doesn't challenge your salvation. It's just a process of weeding out the good works from those that are not good works. You understand? Amen. The fires of God allowed in our lives are for the positive effects of purifying, refining, and strengthening us. Because we're his children. Now, when I had my children growing up, they they, they got some fire once in a while. Amen? Yeah, they'd come up and I'd look at their works and they'd lose reward. And then sometimes they'd get reward. But there was some fire in our household once in a while. God's no different. He loves you. He wants you to be all you can be and do all that you can do. And he's going to work in your life to purge. Fire of God at the judgment seat of Christ, though negative in that it brings loss of rewards, is positive in that its effects are taking away all the inferior and leaving us with only the superior. Listen, friends, when we enter into heaven, there's no inferior left, only superior. There's no old you, only new you. There's no old nature, only new nature. Well, at least I'm excited about it. (laughs) You'll be too when you get there. I think we need to go back to the other point about the energy, amen? (laughs) Some of you need to have a little energy with you this morning. You're sitting there like this. (laughs) 
Now, those of you that worked at the festival yesterday and were here all night cleaning up, I'm giving you a pass. My wife is taking notes. <laughs> all right. And so we have the fire of production. We have the fire of purging. But I want to go to point number three, and that's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Pay close attention to this one. It's called the fire and perdition. You see, there's fire and production. There's fire and purging. And there's fire and perdition. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The truth of the matter is, my friend, that the fire of God will one day fall upon planet earth in complete destruction and obliteration. God says, I will, I will send fire to destroy ten times. He says, I'll send fire to Jerusalem, Judah, Magog, the palaces of Ben-Hadon, the walls of Gaza, the walls of Tyrus, Teman, Moab, and the earth. And when God says he's sending a fire to destroy, it comes and it destroys. But you see how wonderful God is? You see how loving he is? You see how kind he is? He told us ahead of time. Why would God tell us ahead of time that he's going to destroy the earth? The heavens and earth shall pass away with a fervent heat, the Bible says. Why would God tell us about hell? Why would God tell us about fire? Why would he tell? Because he wants us to be saved. He's telling us so we can do something about it while we can. People don't like to hear preaching about hell. Well, my dear friend, Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. People don't want to hear preaching about hell. Because, listen, if you don't hear about preaching about hell, how are you going to escape hell? If you're going to put your head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend it's not there, you're going to have a rude awakening someday. The word perdition used in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 comes from the Greek word apolia, and that word means destruction with loss of well-being, not loss of being. Did you catch the difference? This word means loss of well-being, but not the loss of being. So that means you're going to be, but ain't going to be well. Huh? In Luke chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, Whose fan in is his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, the wheat being born-again Christians, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. The chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. In other words, it's a fire that never goes out. Now, the difference between a, a, a wheat and a chaff is very simple. If you would go into a field of, of wheat, there's always some chaff in every field of wheat. And if you go into a field and you pick a wheat and you pick a chaff, they'll, you hold them up, they'll look just like each other. Very, very similar. Can hard, you have to be an expert to be able to tell them apart. But there's a difference. If you take the wheat and you crush it in your hand, a little kernel comes out. But if you take the chaff and you crush it in your hand, it's empty. You understand? You see, the born-again Christian has Jesus inside, the Holy Spirit of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God, we've got a kernel, amen? amen. But the unsaved are those who are like the chaff. They're empty inside. Oh, they may put religion in there. They may put drugs in there. They may put uh, other things in there and maybe superstitions and so forth. But it's all emptiness. The ones with the kernel go into glory. The empty ones, it says here, shall be burned with fire unquenchable. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My dear friend, there's two deaths. There's a physical death and then there's this death. This is the death. It's called the second death. And it's reserved for those who have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't, their names are not in the Lamb's book of life. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Who's, who's the life? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way you get your name in the Lamb's book of life is by receiving eternal life as a free gift from Jesus Christ by faith. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and, all do- uh, and, and idolaters. And look at the next three words. And all liars. Let me ask you, have you ever told a lie? If you, ha- if you say no, that's your second one. <laughs> all right? And all liars shall have their part. In the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look over at Revelation chapter 17, a few pages back. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall, be, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world that they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth to perdition. Go over to chapter 20 again, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. That's the same lake of fire that the people in Revelation chapter 20 uh, verse 15 are going to be sent to. And so what do we have? We have this lake of fire. It's like the prison house of God. It's where those who have sinned against God go. And so the devil and his angels will go there. And uh, 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 those who never trust Christ as Savior will go there. And the false prophet and the beast of the, of the tribulation period will go there. It's a terrible place. The Bible says it's a place of torment day and night forever and forever. The Bible says it's a place of fire. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, it's called everlasting fire. In Jude chapter 7, it's called vengeance of eternal fire. And let me tell you this. God's not there. It's utter separation from God. Now, the Bible says God is love, so there's no love there. The Bible says God is grace, so there's no grace there. The Bible says God is is light, there's no light there. Everything God is, it'll be the opposite there. In Romans chapter 9, verse 22, it says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? What's that word destruction mean? Loss of well-being, but not loss of being. And who are these who are fitted? How they, who are those who are fitted for destruction or fit for destruction? Unsaved people. Who are trusting in themselves or a religion or rituals. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's that word destruction. It's loss of well-being, but not of being. And who are these who bring upon themselves swift destruction? False teachers. Now how does one fit oneself for destruction and bring oneself to perdition? 2 Thessalonians 1.8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, how, you know why people go to hell? Because they've sinned against God and didn't obey the gospel. That's why. They don't, listen, if you're here today and you're not saved, you're, you're, you know, you're not going to go to hell because... Uh, you told a lie. You're going to go to hell because you didn't trust Christ to forgive your lie. You didn't trust Christ as your Savior to take away your sin. 
God added all liars in that whole list of those horrible people because he wanted us to understand. There's no, you know, it's like big sins, little sins, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. No, that's not how it's going to be. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either forgiven or you're not. Either have eternal life or you don't. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now we're going to look closing at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You see, I just told you the bad news, didn't I? I told you a lot of bad news. If you're here today and you've never been born again, you're going to die and spend eternity in the torments of a literal fiery hell. And you deserve it. Why? Because you've sinned against God. I deserve it. But I'm not going there. I deserve it, but I'm not going there. Why? Because I've accepted the grace of God. I've received Christ my Savior. He forgave my sins and he gave me by his grace the gift of eternal life. And he said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 is the good news. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to come to repentance. Repentance means change your mind. God wants you you're trusting in a church, God wants you to change your mind. Trusting in baptism, change your mind. Trusting in confirmation, change your mind. Trusting in religion, change your mind. Trusting in rituals, change your mind. Trusting in superstitions, change your mind. Right. And God is long suffering. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. How look, he's saying, Look, I love you. I want to save you. I'm waiting for you to change your mind and trust me. Yes, sir. Amen. My dear friend, he's waiting for you. But he won't wait forever. Because the day of the Lord shall come, the Bible says, as a thief in the night. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The answer is you can't escape. You cannot escape the just penalty of your sin if you neglect the salvation made available through Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved saved. Amen. The fire of God. It's for power and production. It's for purging and refining. It's for perdition. The first two are the work in the life of every born again child of God, but the third will be the fate of those who refuse to receive Christ as their Savior. You see, good works have no currency in heaven. Only the blood of the Lamb of God that was shed on Calvary's cross. Speaking of Jesus Christ, John wrote this, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation means satisfactory payment. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And I want to ask those of you today who are sitting in this place, maybe watching or listening, who know that they're born again, you know you're saved, you, you know that you have eternal life, you've received it as a free gift by faith in Christ, would you lift your hand just in the air as a, kind of like a flag to wave to heaven? Yes, thank you, you can put them down. Those who raised their hand, I want to ask you this, is the fire burning within? Is God producing in your life light, heat, and energy for His glory? Is the fire of God purifying and refining you, or do you quench the Spirit? What will the fire of God reveal at the judgment seat of Christ? A selfish life, illustrated in wood, hay, and stubble, or a selfless life, illustrated in gold, silver, and precious stones? Maybe today, dear Christian, you need to come and talk to God. There's something you need to talk to Him about, something He's been working on your heart about, Something that only you know that he's spoken to your heart about. You need to talk to him about it. You come today.
And if you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand a moment ago, are you willing to experience the fire of God's wrath for all eternity? Or will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There are no second chances after you leave this life. Receive Christ while you still can, because tomorrow may be one day too late. Maybe you're here this morning, and you say, right where you sit, you say, preacher, I'm not, I don't have eternal life. I've never been born again. I know I'm not saved, but I know I need to be saved, and I'm willing to trust Christ as my Savior right here in my seat. It's a prayer we can pray together, and it'll be your prayer of faith. But if you're willing to trust Christ as your Savior right where you sit, would you look up at me right now? Just look up. When I see you, I'll know that's what you want to do. Is that what you'd like to do? All right, just hold on. Is that what you'd like to do? All right. Anybody else? Just keep looking until I see you. I don't want to miss you. I'm looking around. All right. Anybody else? I'm still looking. Is that what you need to do? All right. Thank you. Anybody else? If I missed you, put your hand up. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And it's not a magic prayer. It's a prayer of faith. And if you believe what we, what we pray together, God sees that as your faith. And so pray this to the Lord. Say, dear God, I, I admit I'm a sinner. And I, I know there's nothing I can do to save my own soul. But I believe Jesus came. I believe he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for my sins and rose again from the dead so that he could offer me eternal life. And right now, dear Lord, I receive the gift of eternal life by trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Lord, please come into my heart and into my life as my Savior. I'm trusting only in you. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to save me. If you prayed that prayer and meant it in your heart, would you look up at me again? Just by looking up, you're saying yes, all right? All right? Okay. Here's, the, here's what the Bible says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, to him, I giveth unto him eternal life, and he shall never perish. The Bible says we're kept by the power of God unto salvation ready to be revealed at the last trump. On the authority of the word of God, you have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins because you've trusted in Jesus. Father, we thank you today for your love and kindness. Lord, we don't deserve to be saved. We don't deserve to hear the good news. But Father, thank you for sending it our way. I pray, Father, as Christians, we might come and say, Lord, here am I. I want to shine for Jesus. I want to have light and heat and energy. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that perhaps there's Christians here that have lost a little energy or gotten a little lethargic. I pray, my Heavenly Father, you might stir in their hearts a fire. And then I pray for those who trusted Christ as their Savior today. Bless them and encourage them. Help them to know the reality of what they've done. And that, Heavenly Father, they are the children of God by grace through faith in Christ. Lord, I pray you'd bless the invitation as only you can, and we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing number 161. Let's take our hymn books. Stand up, please. 161. Now listen, I'm going to ask you to do something. So far, I've been doing all the work. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. If you're here today and you're a Christian, you're born again and you know it, and God's spoken to your heart, and maybe this morning you'd like to come and get on your face before God and just say, Lord, I want, that. I want to be a light. I want, to, I want to be a heat. I want to have energy for Jesus. I want to put him first. Maybe there's something in your life that God's trying to purge out. Something he's trying to get out of your life. Why don't you come and say, Lord, here it is. I'm giving it to you. You take it. And listen, if you got saved today, I'm going to ask you to take your courage in both hands and come up here and stand with me. And let me tell everybody that you got saved today. That'll glorify God. It'll honor him. It'll strengthen you. All right, so as we sing this hymn, you come as the Lord leads. Must Jesus bear the cross alone And all the world go free No, there's a cross for everyone 
and there's a cross for me. Sean's trusted Christ as Savior today. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Brother Rob, would you come? And uh, he's going to take it and pray with you and give you a little booklet. Okay, Sean? Praise the Lord. This is Rob. This is Sean. All right, we're going we're gonna to sing that, that second stanza. If you've trusted Christ today, come on. Don't be afraid. Amen. You come and stand with me. You don't have to say a word. I'll say it all. All right? Otherwise, Christian's altar still open. There's still room for you. On the second. The consecrated cross I'll bear Till death shall set me free And then go home my cry to wear For there's a crown for me you, when you trust Christ your Savior, He can change, make a change in your life. Before I was saved, I was a professional rock and roll musician, and I was just living the life. Jesus came into my life and made a silk purse hmm. out of a sow's ear. I'll never regret no. taking Jesus as my Savior. No. I'll never regret.